from the historic campus of Hillsdale College in Hillsdale, Michigan, where the good, the true, and the beautiful are taught, nurtured, and honored, this is the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour, bringing the activity and education of the college to listeners across the country. Be safe. We say to everybody at every moment of the day, it seems now in 2023, be safe, be safe, be safe, be safe. You hear it enough and you end up thinking, oh, my, my mission in life is to be safe and do nothing. And it's the opposite in biblical terms. It's to go and take dominion. That's the original mandate. It's to fulfill the great commission by God's strength. This is your host, Scott Bertram, and that's Owen Stran. He's author of the new book, The War on Men, Why Society Hates Them and Why We Need Them. We'll go in-depth with Owen about his arguments a little bit later on in today's program. First... We're joined by Dr. Michael Trepepi. He is Assistant Professor of Physics here at Hillsdale College. Dr. Trepepi, thanks for joining us. Uh, thank you, Scott. You know, I was reading a little bit earlier in the year some stories about Earth's core uh, stopping, slowing, reversing. I'm sure you've seen those same reports. W what does that exactly mean? I is it important or just a, a curiosity that perhaps the Earth's core has stopped spinning? Yeah. So the first thing is uh, kind of, as we like to say in physics, uh, it's what is your reference frame? So what they mean is that the Earth's inner core has stopped spinning relative to the surface of the Earth. So um, the big thing here is that the Earth's core is still rotating because the planet is still rotating. Mm -hmm. But it just means that from our perspective here on the surface, the inner core has seemed to stop. So and, um, you know, it's more for curiosity, um, but it does, you know, uh, knowing this information help us understand uh, geological processes, how uh, the planet formed and kind of even the uh, evolution of uh, Earth's magnetic field. You mentioned that it is still spinning. It's spinning in, now in relation to the spinning of the Earth. Mm -hmm. How does or why would the core spin separately from the rotation of the Earth? Yeah, so it's um, so it has to do with the, the the different layers of the Earth, and so the inner core is surrounded by a liquid outer core. And um, so because that that outer core is a liquid, it kind of allows the inner core to rotate somewhat freely from uh, uh, us, the rest of the planet. So take us a little bit beneath our feet. Mm -hmm. We've been talking about the inner core and then there's a liquid core. So <laughs> so how far down do we go to get to this core layer and, and, and what, what is underneath us? Yeah, yeah. So kind of first first reference of, of measurement is that, uh, you know, the Earth is about 8,000 miles wide. Um, so it takes about 4,000 miles to get to the center, the exact center of the Earth. And so kind of the first layer of the Earth is the crust. And kind of depending on where you are, um, you know, if you're uh, over the ocean or on a continent, that can be anywhere from three to 25 miles thick. Um, that's where you get all of your bedrock, your tectonic plates and that. And then the, the layer below that is what's called the mantle. Mm -hmm. And that's about 1,800 miles uh, thick. And that's kind of this semi-molten, semi-solid region of rock. And it's kind of what causes the tectonic plates to move. And um, it also transfers heat kind of from the interior to the exterior of the planet. And then... So once once we get past the mantle, then we reach what is the core. And um, there's kind of two major layers to that. There's the outer core, which is this liquid iron, nickel, and even sulfur layer. And um, that's about 1,400 miles thick, so a little bit smaller or a little bit less than the mantle, but still pretty big. And then uh, you get to the inner core, which is uh, about... 800 miles thick, though, really what uh, at that point, since it's at the center, a better reference would be to say it's uh, 1600 miles wide. And so kind of for reference to like the moon is uh, about 2200 miles wide. Hmm. So it's um, a little bit smaller than the moon. But uh, if you count, you know, it's uh, some people like to say it's like a planet inside of a planet sort of deal, or at least maybe a moon inside of the planet. <laughs> How much do we really know about the Earth's core? We haven't been there. Mm -hmm. We can't drill down that far. So how do we know what we know about 
what's in there and, and how do we study it? Yeah, no, it's a it's a good point. We uh, we can't drill down that far. Actually, the uh, deepest that we've drilled is a little bit over seven and a half miles. So thirteen hundred and ninety to go. Yes. So we <laughs> yeah. So we haven't even made it past the crust, really. But it, it turns out we can actually know a fair amount from it. A, a lot of our information about Earth's interior comes from the refraction of seismic waves through the Earth. And so the idea is that, say, you have tremors from an earthquake and those travel you know, both through the earth and kind of along the surface of the earth. And that having, you know, seismometers around the earth, you can then uh, pick up, you know, the intensity of these waves and their frequency. And that'll give you information about the material that they have to travel through. And so um, you combine that with information about, you know, how materials behave at high temperatures and pressures. And you can actually do that in the lab. So there's a a device called a diamond anvil cell. And it's essentially these um, kind of big metal blocks with diamonds on the tips of them. And you stick uh, whatever material you're interested in kind of in between the two diamond points. And then you just crank down on it as hard as you possibly can. And um, that provides the pressure. And then if you want to turn up the temperature, you can uh, apply some laser, you can shoot some lasers at it uh, and increase the temperature. And so we can get an idea of how uh, materials act uh, under these high temperatures and pressures. And then, you know, after that, you just you start to develop a uh, a model and an inference on what the the planet's structure and uh, its makeup and temperature have to be at all these different layers. Talking with Dr. Michael Trepepi about uh, the Earth's core and these reports that the core has slowed spinning, stopped spinning, or perhaps even reversed. I'll ask about that in, in a second. You alluded to the core's effect on our magnetic fields. Mm -hmm. how, how does that come into play? Yeah, so it's um, so Earth's magnetic field is generated um, by actually the rotations in the outer core. So the outer core, as I said, was uh, made of liquid metal. And so that that metal uh, kind of circulates around. And uh, since it can conduct electricity, you have then electrical currents uh, kind of in the heart of the earth. And so those electrical currents produce uh, magnetic fields. And so um, the inner so while the inner core doesn't directly produce the magnetic field, it's it, it is involved with that process. Um, its rotation uh, can affect these uh, convection currents in the outer core. And um, so and it also too, since the inner core is may is basically a solid chunk of iron, you know, it can help uh, amplify these magnetic fields and, and so forth. And some of these reports are indicating that perhaps if it's slowed, it's also reversed. Now, does that mean reversed in terms of now moving the opposite direction of the Earth's? Yeah. Okay. So how how would that happen? How would that happen? Well, it's a it's a number of different factors. So again, it's because the inner core is inside of this uh, li is surrounded rather by this liquid outer core, and so the you know, the convection currents of this liquid layer are connected to the rotation of the inner core. And similarly, these can, they're also connected to the rotation of just the mantle and the crust, uh, the layers that we're on. And so, so it's kind of the, the, this connection. So it's a, it's a, it's a complex system. <laughs> and so it's, uh, you know, and, that, and that's kind of part of the exciting thing about this research is, uh, you know, what is that, what is that connection does Earth's inner core stop rotating? Is that part of a natural cycle? Is that an anomaly? Is that, you know, more, more study? It's a, it's a complex system, but it, it is tied into it. Yeah. So I, I need to ask the question that I know all of our listeners uh, want to know from this conversation, which is, are we all going to die because the Earth's core is now shifting or st oh, okay. stop spinning, right? That's, yeah. that's the important thing. Is it going to, going to affect us? Yeah. Uh, short answer is probably not. <laughs> um, <laughs> remember, it's the, it's the outer core that generates the magnetic field. So we don't have to worry about, uh, you know, suddenly losing the, the Earth's magnetic field because the inner core has stopped rotating. There are things called uh, magnetic flips, but that's uh, believed to be a different process. So <laughs> it should be okay. It's what you're telling us. Uh, we should be okay. Not that there's a whole lot we can do mm -hmm. if uh, if it does, but yeah, I wouldn't. Uh, th there's there's different categories of dangers I I put things in, and uh, I put this in the you know it, it 
you know, hypothetically it could, but there's not much you can do about it. So it's not worth worrying, I yeah. suppose. Dr. Michael Trepepe, he is assistant professor of physics here at Hillsdale College. Dr. Trepepe, thanks so much for joining us here on the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. Thank you. Up next, Owen Strand, his new book, The War on Men, Why Society Hates Them and Why We Need Them. I'm Scott Bertram. This is the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. Hillsdale College is a small, Christian, classical liberal arts college that operates independently of government funding. And we want you or your son or daughter to apply. At Hillsdale, students grow in heart and mind by studying timeless truths in a supportive community dedicated to the highest things. Hillsdale College costs significantly less than other nationally ranked private liberal arts colleges and receives regular recognition as a best value. And nearly all students receive financial aid. Our robust core curriculum, vibrant student life, an 8 to 1 student to faculty ratio make for an education like no other. For more information or to fill out an application, visit hillsdale.edu backslash info. That's hillsdale.edu backslash info. Welcome back to the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. I'm Scott Bertram. Be sure to check out podcast.hillsdale.edu. It's the Hillsdale College Podcast Network. Find older episodes of this program, plus other great Hillsdale shows like The Larry Arn Show, The Hillsdale Dialogues, and Imprimus, all at podcast.hillsdale.edu. We're joined by Owen Strand. He is Provost and Research Professor of Theology at Grace Bible Theological Seminary, also Senior Fellow for Family Research Council's Center for Biblical Worldview. He also has a new book, The War on Men, Why Society Hates Them and Why We Need Them. Owen, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Scott. Thanks for having me back. You uh, you say early on in, in the book, Christians see strong men as the solution to our earthly struggles. Our culture sees strong men as the problem. And this is where we bring in that word that is written many times in the book and heard many times throughout the course of a day by many Americans, toxicity, male toxicity. Where does that come from? And why does our culture see it as such an, a problem? A major claim I am saying in this book is that men are not toxic. And in doing so, you're exactly right. I am totally punching against the culture. I am saying the dead-level opposite of what boys and young men now hear on a regular basis from every angle. The claim that men are toxic, and it comes from a, a concoction of ideologies, really, but uh, if you want to blend them together, woke feminist paganism. Basically, uh, there's, there's really two worldviews that base. There's there's twoism and oneism, as Peter Jones has called it. There's the creator and the creature, and that accords with a, a Christian worldview or even a religious worldview, if you want to put it that way. And then there's oneism, which basically reduces everything to one. There's not really a divine creator. We live how we want, and uh, we, we do whatever we see fit. And we are currently uh, battling it out between twoism and oneism. And the oneists are saying, in so many words, that it is a terrible thing to be an assertive, aggressive, risk-taking, stoic man. And the two are saying, from the Word of God and, and history, the witness of history secondarily, no, boys and young men actually need to be trained to be leaders. They're not being toxic when they step up. They're not being toxic when they show aggression necessarily. Uh, they're not being toxic when they want to play aggressive games on the playground, as many do. They're actually acting out their God-given wiring. So we're, we're in a battle of uh, whether there is a certain created form for men or not. And I am here to say, absolutely, God has made boys, God has made men, and he's wired them a certain way. They need shepherding. They need a gospel of divine grace, ultimately. They need an arm around their shoulder, absolutely. They need a lot of correction, boys and young men do. I say this as a father. But they, what they don't need, Scott, is to be dismissed and demeaned and called toxic. You say that struggling men fall into four categories of deficiency, and a lot of the book is talking through those categories. If you want to briefly define or talk about soft man, exaggerated man, lost man, and angry man. You see, 
the angry man in Genesis 4 as Cain rises up against Abel and kills him in jealousy. So I am not calling in this book for men to act out manhood in any form. There's all kinds of of evil that men bring into the world. Men and women alike are sinners and each in need, equal need, of the gospel of divine grace. But the average strength of men and testosterone of men, 50 to 60 percent more upper body strength men to women, uh, 2,000 to 3,000 percent more testosterone men to women on average means that the sins of men, and all men are sinners, just as all women are sinners, can have outsized effects. You see that throughout the Bible. You see it in Cain. Cain is an angry man. Lots of angry men around us, and that has a real effect. Uh, then there's the exaggerated man of Samson. Samson puffs his chest out, Judges 13 to 16 in the Old Testament, goes and gets whatever he wants. He's a real historical figure, and he speaks to that kind of desire of modern men to be like an Andrew Tate, to go get it, to have a harem of women behind you, who God is in front of you, and live life on your own terms. And that man needs the grace of God as well. You see the soft man in the form of Gideon, also in the book of Judges. Gideon is fearful and passive and soft. He doesn't want to step forward. He doesn't want to lead. He doesn't want to risk anything. And so he is uh, he is another example of deficient manhood. You see the lost man in Adam in the garden, the real historical garden of Genesis 3, when after he has failed to protect his wife from the serpent, as he was called to do, uh, Satan actually showing up in the garden in serpentine form historically, uh, Adam doesn't step up to the plate. And uh, then when the Lord God shows up to set up a courtroom uh, in a garden, Adam blames God, the woman you gave me, and blames Eve. And so Adam disappears from the scene, basically. He's nowhere to be found. Mm-hmm. And we've got tons of disappearing men as well, Scott. So there's all sorts of ways <laughs> men can fail. So I'm not, I'm not saying in the War on Men, this book, uh, I'm here to just be a cheerleader, you know, throwing up the pom-poms for men. No, men need help, and they need spiritual help. There's a chapter to explaining why men are struggling, and I thought a couple of interesting points inside that chapter in The War on Men. You discuss the growth of fear culture, the loss of risk culture, and the goal of comfort above all else, which I've heard discussed at a few places recently. Why is that desire for, for comfort above all causing men to struggle? Men innately don't want to be safe. Men want danger. Men want uh, not to be somebody sitting on the sidelines of the great movements in history. Men, at the very least, dream of uh, being in, in heroic struggles. And yet our culture has taken that away from men. And I'm not here to say if you live in the suburbs, you know, your dream has forever died. I live in the suburbs, you know, there's not a ton of wilderness wandering my kids can do. And yet I am here to say that in the cause of Jesus Christ, when we are saved, when we are born again and know Jesus Christ as our Savior by His blood and His resurrection for us, then we are able to go on a grand mission for Christ and give God glory all throughout our life, build a vocation, serve our church, love our family, strengthen what remains, build into our community. But that's not a vision that is popular for today, because men are encouraged to embrace uh, a, a plastic life, I call it, a life where you're virtualized, where you fight heroic battles, but only on a screen, where you might uh, have a virtual sex slave before you on your device in terms of pornography, where um, you don't really even have a meaningful vocation. You just kind of log into this or that. It's not bad to have online work or something, but, but if you're not careful, your whole life can become plastic and virtual as a man. And that's the opposite of what God wants for us men. Whether married or single, we have different callings in the Church, First Corinthians 7. We as men want to say, my life is supposed to count. I, I want to get invested in this grand mission of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is not a Savior who fundamentally comes to me and tucks me in and gives me a cup of hot cocoa at night. Jesus Christ is a Savior who comes to me with fire in his eyes, wakes me up in the dead of night, and says, let's go hunt. Let's go hunt down some forces of darkness. And that's more the vision of manhood I'm trying to give men in the war on men, whether they're Christian or not. The loss of work and the loss of meaningful endeavors. You say in a climate like this, young men will become obsessed with unserious things and will lose interest in serious things. What what are those serious things that young men should be concerned with? The loss of work means the loss of manhood in functional terms. Men are made to work. Genesis 2.15, the Lord said to Adam to work and keep or protect the garden. So work is wired into the nature of a man. And though we all have to battle for passivity and laziness, me included, we're, again, we're made to work. And that means that we flourish when we have meaningful work to do, 
But our culture with lockdown cultures, with, uh, you know, with safety based culture, be safe. We say to everybody at every moment of the day, it seems now in 2023, be safe, be safe, be safe, be safe. You hear it enough and you end up thinking, oh, my, my mission in life is to be safe and do nothing. And it's the opposite in biblical terms. It's to go and take dominion. That's the original mandate. It's to fulfill the great commission by God's strength. So God wants men, in some, to get out there and get working. But uh, work rates are about at a historic low in America for men in their prime working years, as I show in this book, The War on Men. Uh, men are just disappearing from the workforce in epic form. And um, that isn't just a little statistical, you know, anecdote. Oh, how interesting. Men are dropping out of the workforce. No, Scott, that's telling you that men are doing terribly. My dad dropped me in a blueberry field when I was 12 and said, rake blueberries. And I did. And it was so good for me. It was very hard work. It was not fun. It was long hours in the sun in the summer. But I earned some of that school clothes money. It was really good for me. Boys need that. But to, to get boys there today... We're going to have to rebuild cultures where boys get launched into working and see work not as a bad thing, but as a good thing. Talking with Owen Strand, his book is The War on Men, Why Society Hates Them and Why We Need Them. Strand, by the way, S-T-R-A-C-H-A-N. Then some time on the foundation of manhood on Genesis, on the Old Testament. There's a line in one of those chapters about how... You cannot stay boys forever. There has to be a, a, a transition. When do we know when that transition occurs, and, and how do we encourage it? That's a great question. Here's what I've been doing with my own son, who is 12. I, I don't have this all figured out and wouldn't claim to, Scott, but I have realized I need to stop referring to this 12-year-old son as a boy, and I need to refer to him as a young man. And even that is a massive step in the right direction. Uh, again, not some genius principle, but if you think about it, we're, we're not keeping our boys, boys or kids as long as we can. And then all of a sudden, you know, at age 29, we say, hey, presto changeo, you're a man. That's, that's not really going to serve them. Whatever we do, whether there's an initiation ceremony we choose to do or something like that, you can. That can be a good thing. You don't have to do it biblically. But whatever, however that is stewarded, the process from boy to man, it needs to be understood and articulated in a home from a father to his son, and also to his girls, by the way, into womanhood with his wife working very closely with them, that there is this, there is this change happening. That, but, but not that there's a perfect year. It, it, we shouldn't get lost in what year this happens. That would be going to the wrong place and, and getting lost in the wheat. The clearer principle is this. We're training our boys into men. And so, you know, as they get into, I guess, what you could call maybe those preteen years or teen years, we now start talking about them as young men, as, as future men. And so, uh, honestly, you know, we were just talking about work. When I, when I go outside and do yard work <laughs> in my suburb in Arkansas with my son, I say, hey, buddy, you know, you know I, don't, I don't rail at him. Hey, we're working. Become a worker. Too, too, too often today, when boys and men are at track, it's only in that red-faced football coach mode. Mm -hmm. And really, the dominant mode of engagement for our boys and young men should be arm around the shoulder, calm, patient, but also instructing, shepherding, discipling. And that's what I'm trying to do. I'm saying, hey, buddy, we're just doing 20 minutes of weeding right now uh, to, to, to bless your mother. But um, what we're doing is working. And one day, you're not just going to do 20 minutes, my man. You're going to be doing eight hours of this. And this is good, by the way. It's hard. And yeah, the fire ants are, are trying to get us here <laughs> in this uh, barren soil. But keep going. Keep working hard. And so I'm trying to train him, Scott. The, the principle is to see himself now as a, as a young man. The next few chapters are the foundation of strong manhood through Jesus Christ, through the New Testament. You have a, a line and a section here that I really enjoyed. There is a certain strangeness to marriage that we must not miss or try to erase. Tell us more about that. Marriage is a picture of Christ and his church. It's a picture of the gospel in Ephesians 5, 22 to 33 in the New Testament. And so as a husband leads his wife well, he images Christ always imperfectly, but nonetheless truly. As a wife submits to her husband in everything uh, that is not sinful, that is moral, she images the church loving Christ not perfectly, but truly. And so there's this mystery to marriage where two become one. 
And there's the further mystery for many of us men that we get to and embark on the lifelong project of trying to understand womanhood. It is a PhD program um, of advanced study. It is not easy. It it requires us to try to understand our wife, no less than an apostle, calls us to be understanding men with regard to our wives, which which I think, uh, I'm being a little bit puckish here, (laughs) but I think indicates that, that, yeah, there's a little bit of mystery to this, and and, uh, it's going to be, there's going to be some ebb and flow. There's going to be some, okay, now we are feeling this, now there's this, I've got to pull out what you're what you're thinking. You you have desires and expectations for me that are oftentimes helpful and needful in my own life. But what are those? Uh, let's articulate that. And so fundamentally, the scripture doesn't call men to be these um, these lords on high who never hear a word from their wife, but only issue orders from a mountaintop peak. Men are called to be uh, the authority in the home, the authority in the home. They are called to that. Though the culture demeans husbands and fathers though it calls them idiots and goofballs, though it regularly in film and TV, social media portrays men as being less than women and not worthy of leadership and authority. The opposite is true in the biblical worldview. Men are called to a position of nobility and authority, but men, godly men anyway, are not perfect, but they are not threatened by a wise wife. They are not threatened by a wife's counsel. In fact, they want these things. They see their wife as their helper in a Genesis 2 sense, Helper is a very bad term in modern America. Nobody wants to put that in their social media profile. Put that on your LinkedIn page uh, and see see the acclaim that comes. But in the Bible, being a helper is an exalted term. God himself refers to himself as the helper of Israel. And, and a, what what helper means for a woman is is not that you know once in a while she provides a, you know a one minute little surge of help. It means she has traits, skills, abilities, wisdom knowledge to bring to the table. And so the man is responsible for leading, but he he's always having this conversation with his wife, drawing her out, and then yet he is charged to make um, decisions for the family. There's mystery in all of this. It's, it's a dance, um, but, but it's a beautiful reality. Oh, and you have sections on the power of testosterone, how adrenaline keeps us safe. Testosterone, adrenaline, those are uh, some of the major things pointed at by those people saying that men are are toxic. There's the toxicity of manhood. Why is adrenaline, why is testosterone so important for men and their role in society? Yeah, testosterone today has been terminated. No less a public figure than uh, the Terminator director, James Cameron, Avatar director as well, has said that uh, publicly, quote, testosterone is poison, poison. Uh, end quote. And so you realize when you're hearing a guy who has made a fair number of uh, manly films say that in our time, you've seen a cultural shift of a massive form where it used to it used to be seen as a good thing to take initiative, to risk, to be assertive, to be aggressive in appropriate form in American culture and films and that sort of thing. But now it's seen as bad. And now men are just supposed to be very in touch with their feminine side very touchy-feely, um, not warriors, not heroes. In fact, in many of the modern films, the superhero films that seem to be, well, before the writer strike were out seemingly every week in America, that the man, typically the hero, air quotes, needed to be saved by the heroine. You saw this in The Mandalorian, for example, just a year or so ago. And so that was really the gelding, by the way, of this major Western figure in the space context, the Mandalorian, who had come out of nowhere as kind of a strong warrior figure, and then by season two or three has to be getting saved by the heroine beside mm-hmm. him. And so we see a lot of that in our society today. But what, what I'm trying to say in The War on Men in this book is that uh, men are called, by virtue of their God-given wiring, to step up, to take risks when there is danger, Men are the ones who should seek to handle it first. Men actually need to compartmentalize, though men are are dinged for not being as emotionally accessible as women. And there's sure the growth that needs to occur in every man's life, including mine, uh, in terms of emotions and that sort of thing, articulating emotions and all that. Nonetheless, you also have to have men compartmentalize. You have to have men focus on tasks. You have to have men who will go to war be away from wife and children, hearth and home for nine months or a year, fight the enemy, protect protect their country, lead for their nation, and uh, and sacrifice themselves, many of them, 
But um, all of those kind of virtues go definitely against woke feminist paganism today. So again, we can't accommodate that worldview. We should love those who are trapped in it and seek their rescue from it by the power of Christ. But what we can do is say, "Uh uh-uh, nope, line in the sand, in our home, in this church, in this college, in this institution, wherever it may be, we stand for strong manhood. Not strong manhood against women and children, strong manhood for women and children. The innate wiring of a man needs to be shepherded and corrected and trained, but that innate wiring of a man to be assertive, to be aggressive, to take risks, to face down danger, that is good wiring. Owen Strand with us, the book, The War on Men. At the end, you have a plan for boys and a way back for men. And there are multiple parts here. I wanted to talk about the third part. We need to ennoble men. Men are noble, bearing great dignity, bearing great purpose. If boys or young men are, are confused about this, uh, what is their role? What is, what is their purpose? How do you answer that? Huge question. In some, my book, The War on Men, is really... Uh, one extended shot at that, at saying to men, fundamentally, you're a sinner. You need God's grace, as I've tried to say here. But you're not an idiot. Um, you're not a goofball. And by the way, if you have given in to your flesh, if you have uh, been attacked by the culture and believed it's lies, if your marriage isn't in the strongest place or even is over, if you don't have great relationships with your children, if your work situation is rough, if you lost your job, or even if you're succeeding in life externally and everything's going great, but internally things are not going great in your soul or, again, in some of those quieter relationships in your life. Here's what I'm trying to say. I'm not trying to come at you and scream at you. I'm not trying to tell you you have no worth and you have no value, you stupid, toxic loser. This is what you get for being a man. That is the total opposite of what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to put an armor around the shoulder of men, um, you know, pull them in and say, hey, God, you can change. You can grow. The grace of God transforms, it saves, it changes. And so even if you are in a very desperate place now, God will work in your heart by his grace. So that's really the message I hope that men hear. Sometimes with manhood material, Scott, with the manosphere, with the guys uh, that are listened to, even in some positive ways, in common grace terms, Jocko Willink or David Goggins, Jordan Peterson, Joe Rogan, the list goes on. Sometimes there's just like this call to the stand that the speaker fits. You know, he's in amazing shape. He's got 3.7% body fat. And yeah, he's calling men to something good, physical discipline, becoming stronger, stewarding your body. But it's like this standard that honestly, basically no one can reach. And it actually ends up discouraging men in the end, even if they're initially encouraged a lot of the time. And what we're trying to say in the church is absolutely take ownership of yourself, absolutely become strong in every area, though you are weak. But fundamentally, when you falter, the whole deal with Christianity is not that you get cast aside. Uh, the whole deal is that God keeps working with you and, and grows you and forgives you and helps you. And that, above all, Scott, I believe, is the message that men most need. Owen Strand, the new book, The War on Men, Why Society Hates Them and Why We Need Them. Again, if you're looking, it's Strand, S-T-R-A-C-H-A-N. Owen, thank you so much for joining us here on the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. Thanks for the great interview. Appreciate it. Up next, Kelly Scott Franklin from Hillsdale's English Department. We discuss his piece in the Wall Street Journal, Walt Whitman's Watch Over the War Dead. I'm Scott Bertram. This is the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. Hello, this is Kyle Mernon, Director of Online Learning here at Hillsdale College. And I'm excited to announce that we've brought Hillsdale's popular and free online courses to the Hillsdale College Podcast Network. And we're starting with one of my favorites, The Second World Wars, a course taught by Victor Davis Hanson and Hillsdale President Larry Piarn. After listening to all eight episodes, you'll have a clear picture of why the war was fought and how the Allied powers ultimately triumphed. The Hillsdale College Online Courses podcast, which I co-host with my colleague here, Juan Davalos, 
pursues Hillsdale's mission to provide all who wish to learn the education necessary to preserve the civil and religious liberties of America. And we want you to be a part of it at podcast.hillsdale.edu. Subscribe now to the Hillsdale College Online Courses Podcast to hear new episodes every week with additional commentary and insights from our team. Go to podcast.hillsdale.edu to learn more. That's podcast.hillsdale.edu. Thanks for listening. Welcome back to the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. I'm Scott Bertram. Be sure to follow the show on X, formerly Twitter, at Hillsdale Radio. Get updates on new shows and guest information. We're joined by Dr. Kelly Scott Franklin, Associate Professor of English at Hillsdale College. Dr. Franklin, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. We uh, discussed today a piece you wrote for the Wall Street Journal, WSJ.com, on a Walt Whitman piece, Vigil Strange, I kept on the field one night, and you can find it under Walt Whitman's Watch Over the War Dead. This was published a couple of months ago, and we, we talk now. In that time frame, unfortunately, this piece, this poem, perhaps became a little more relevant in your life. Yeah, absolutely. And you and I have been meaning to talk about it uh, for a while, but um, earlier this year, my, my mom passed away. And so I was just thinking about how now we're going to sit down and talk about this poem about mourning and about burying the dead. And that's that's something I've done now. That's that's something that's relevant. And I, I think that's part of why I love literature and part of why I teach literature and part of how we talk about it in, even in the classroom is that th- this is not a purely intellectual endeavor. Literature speaks to our heart and to our experience about the most important things of being a human. And and one of those is burying the dead. And that's literature also changes as we, as we read it. I I tell my students, you know, come back and read this poem when you have kids or (laughs) come back and write it. And the way that the work remains the same yet changes as you read it, as your experience changes. So that that's been definitely true for me. So let's talk a bit about uh, the author first, Walt Walt Whitman and and writing on the civil war. How does Whitman get his experience of the war? Yeah, Whitman, you know, he 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 lived through the beginning of the war and was already writing a little bit about the war, about this great national crisis. But in December of 1862, at the Battle of Fredericksburg, which is just an absolute disaster for the Union, Walt Whitman's brother George gets injured and is listed in as as one of the casualties in the newspaper and he's listed under the wrong name and it's not clear like is he dead is he severely injured and so Whitman just leaves immediately and goes to the front to try to find his brother communications you know between the front and civilians were were pretty disrupted a lot mm-hmm. of times so he gets he and he has quite an adventure. He gets his pocket picked. He has no money, but then somebody gives him some money. And then he, he rides a train and he finds his way to, to, to where the Union Army is, is some of their some field hospitals and they've kind of retreated back a little bit. And he gets there and the, the good news is that he finds his brother. His brother George is, you know, it's only a minor wound to his cheek. And so he's he's relieved about that. But he writes in his in his a letter and in his notebook that one of the first things he saw, Whitman saw, when he gets to the to the front and to the this field hospital is a, a heap of amputated limbs, and he says it's enough for a, to fill a one horse cart. So mm-hmm. it's not a small, it's not a couple of limbs. It's it's a huge heap of amputated limbs, and that sight of you know maimed body parts is just it's burned into Whitman's consciousness. So, like I said, there's there's a, a sort of a happy ending to it for Whitman in that he finds his brother. His brother's fine. And Whitman spends some time there, uh, the end of 1862, and then and then very early 1863, with the men in the camp. He gets to tour around, see what soldier life is, and then he makes one of the most important decisions in his entire life, and that is somehow he decides to go back to to move to Washington D.C. He's not living in D.C. at the time. He decides to move to Washington D.C. and volunteer. He takes like a a job to to pay the bills, but then he decides to devote himself to volunteering in the hospitals. Uh, 
And it's, it's there that he really, you can see it in his notebooks. He claims, and we haven't found this notebook, but he claims that some of his notebooks even have blood stains in them. That's hmm. how he's, he's volunteering in the hospitals and he's, he's jotting things down about the men and about um, ideas for poems. This is where some of his greatest writing this season is some, where some of his greatest writing occurs. And that includes this, this marvelous elegy Vigil Strange I Kept on the Field One Night. It's a, it's a, a poem about drawn out of uh, stories he had heard and his own experiences in the Civil War. So what is the, the really simple narrative that we see contained inside this poem? Yeah, yeah. Uh, in a sense, it's, it is very simple. There's almost nothing that happens. The, the speaker of the poem describes being in battle and seeing his comrade in arms fall and die. And then the battle moves on and he's swept away with combat and he comes back in the night and keeps a wake or a vigil with the, the body of his comrade and then buries him. And, and the entire poem is just that, like you say, kind of simple narrative. We hear the narrator in this poem talking about spending sweet hours with the deceased and there's references to how much time he's able to spend this is at a time when, of course, the pace of combat would be frenetic. It's the middle of the Civil War. It's a battlefield. What should we take about that, uh, that dichotomy? Yeah, the poem is, I hesitate to use the word slow because that makes it sound boring. It's not, it's, it's, but it's slow time. It's leisure. It's, it's um, a kind of careful, drawn out poem of, of, of mourning and vigil. And there's just that act of accompaniment the speaker describes these sweet hours he says he comes back to the battlefield i found you found you in death so cold dear comrade and then he says i bared your face in the starlight curious the scene cool blew the moderate night wind long there and then in vigil i stood dimly around me the battlefield spreading Vigil wondrous and vigil sweet there in the fragrant, silent night. I think it's it's beautiful in, in that it's it's so slow, but it's also trying to answer something that, as you pointed out, was really hard to do. So often the pace of battle is just moving soldiers along. They've got to dig a mass grave. They've got to dig shallow graves. And you can see Civil War photographs of these shallow graves with the, the earth way heaped up. And, mm -hmm. and, and there were many mass graves f for Civil War dead. Whitman imagines, uh, what, if, what if I could take that time to really mourn, to really grieve, and to really take my time in this very curious thing that we do with our dead, which is we sit with their body for a time. Mm -hmm. Many cultures do that. We, before we put them into the ground, we sit with their remains as if it's a time of saying goodbye, as if it's a time of meditation. You know, for many of us, it's a time of prayer. Whitman tries to create that in the poem, perhaps in a way to fill in for something that, that many soldiers didn't get. Talking with Dr. Kelly Scott Franklin about Walt Whitman's vigil strange I kept on the field one night. He wrote about it in the Wall Street Journal, Walt Whitman's watch over the war dead. As important as what is included in this poem is what is left out. What does Whitman choose to exclude? Yeah, it's it's a really interesting set of choices that Whitman makes as he as he writes this poem, kind of crafts this scene. So he tells us right that that the wind is is cool and that there's a it's that the night is silent and fragrant he gives us to believe that it's a kind of a, a, a silent and quiet scene right what is he doing he's leaving out a lot of the really grisly realities of battle the really gritty and and frankly unpleasant horrible traumatic qualities of a battlefield right you 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 don't smell gunpowder. Mm -hmm. right? If you read if you read Civil War accounts from soldiers, right, the, the battlefield reeks of gunpowder. And if it's been a battle that's gone on for a couple of days back and forth over this terrain, there's dead horses everywhere. There's dead dead men, and this is not a fragrant place. But Whitman he wants 
this soldier, this fictional soldier, to have a silent, it's a vigil of silence, he says. It's a silent vigil. It's a, it's a, the night is silent and fragrant. He wants to create as much beauty as possible in a way to, once again, like we said about the slowness of the poem, he wants to, to step in and answer something that was really denied so many soldiers and so many families of soldiers that is a, a, a good and peaceful burial, a good and peaceful vigil that's not disrupted by the screams of men dying of thirst and blood loss, right? That the horror of real battle is muted. And he also leaves out two other very important, kind of like the key things he leaves out are the name of the soldier. We don't get the name. Right. We don't know who this is. And, and, that's on purpose, right? Whitman wants this poem to be for any of the men who died and for the families sure. and friends and loved ones of any of the men who died. This is a kind of every man burial. And to, to kind of clinch that, he deliberately leaves out whether this soldier or whether the whole scene, the speaker and the soldier are Union or Confederate. This is a poem of uh, with that, that I think features Whitman's reconciliational or reconciliationist impulse. That is, he wants a poem that can speak to the grief of North and South, to the grief of every soldier and any soldier who, who lost a comrade, to the, to the grief of any family and every family who lost a son, a brother, a, a husband, a father. The poem leaves out those key details so that it becomes a, a kind of universal poem of grief. And of course, we consider the thousands upon thousands of soldiers who don't get this kind of vigil after their death in something like the Civil War. So, so why does Whitman consider these shared rituals, our shared rituals, important even during a time like this? Where does he see the value? Yeah, the, the poem is very ritual. He repeats the word vigil 12 times. The poem's only 26 lines, and, the, and you get 12 times he says vigil. Vigil of silence, love, and death. Vigil for you, my son and my soldier. He's, he's chanting. There's a kind of funeral chant or liturgical chant. And then he describes this sort of very long, night-long wake, which is a ritual that we do. And then he describes just how carefully... He gives us these doubled adverbs, well and carefully, well and carefully. And he describes wrapping the body, enveloping the body, folding the body in this blanket. This is a meticulous process. It's careful. It's ritual. It's not tumbling these remains into a mass grave. Mm -hmm. He's The poem itself is enacting that ritual, which so many soldiers were denied. And, you know, why do we need, why do we need ritual? I was... Uh, I was thinking about what you know what what is the role of ritual in culture and I, I guess I would say two things about about the role of ritual why we need why we need rituals and, and what they do for us it seems like a ritual reminds me that I'm part of something that's bigger than myself that is I suspend my own desires and appetites and and needs and plans to participate in this you know usually communal activity that has a set of rules around it right you know we bury people a certain way and not another way and and cultures have their own norms about these things i think it's ritual shared rituals are one of the things that keeps human community from just becoming atomized or fragmented, mm -hmm. where it's just a bunch of individuals pursuing their own needs, desires, appetites, plans. I think ritual resists individualism, and we we come together to collaborate in in an act that signals to us, that reminds us that we're part of something bigger. And then I think the other thing that ritual does for us or signals to us is is that we're touching something transcendent. We're touching something, and in a way you could say almost it's just another version of the same thing. I'm touching something bigger than me, but it, it's when humans encounter the mysterious, the transcendent, that thing that's bigger than just eating and working and, mm -hmm. and, and surviving, that birth, death, marriage, various uh, coming of age rituals, like you know, for Jews and Christians, you have these different rituals of coming of age. You, those rituals are touching something that's mysterious, something beyond us. Our, our, 
the mysterious thing that happens when a new life is created, the mysterious thing that happens to a, a person when he dies. I think that the great writers and really all humans in, in every era have had a sense that there's something mysterious about the universe, whether, whether they call that God or eternal life or whatever that is, that there's something that's not just in the, the, the visible physical here and now, that there's something transcendent beyond us. And when, when we feel like we're touching that or encountering that, we want rituals to help us to mm -hmm. encounter that and understand that and to, to relate to the transcendent properly in a way that's also always uh, rituals need to always be. And, and the best rituals are really good for us as human beings. Dr. Kelly Scott Franklin, Associate Professor of English at Hillsdale College, talking about his piece at The Wall Street Journal, WSJ.com, Walt Whitman's Watch Over the War Dead. Dr. Franklin, thanks for joining us here on the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. Thank you for having me. That will wrap up this edition of the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour. Our thanks to Michael Trepepe from Hillsdale's Physics Department, Owen Strand, his new book, The War on Men, and Kelly Scott Franklin from Hillsdale's English Department. The Radio Free Hillsdale Hour is recorded at the studios of WRFH, the student-run radio station at Hillsdale College. Remember, you can hear new episodes every week on this station. You also can find extended versions of some of our interviews, Kelly Scott Franklin this week, or listen anytime to the podcast. Find it at podcast.hillsdale.edu or wherever you get your audio. The assistant producer of the program is Sam Lair. Until next week, I'm Scott Bertram, and this has been the Radio Free Hillsdale Hour.